Welcome to Operation Solid Lives Level 3. This is actually the fifth lesson in our series that we've entitled The Sword of the Spirit. And we want to keep coming back to our, our theme text, our, our set of verses for this uh, series, which is found in Ephesians chapter 6. I want you to go to verse 13 and let's, let's work our way down to verse 18. Ephesians 6 verse 13 says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand or withstand in that evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to, uh, just preach that right now. Tell somebody you will be able to. Turn to somebody, tell them that. You will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, the rhema, the spoken word of God. Now, let's couple that with the other key verses, Hebrews 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4 says that the word, the logos, the different word in the Greek than what was referenced earlier in Ephesians 6, it's not rhema, it's the logos, it's the written word of God, is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So what we gather from this is that when we speak what God's Word says. When I say what God says, that is the sword of the Spirit being put to use. Now, Jesus used this sword of the Spirit. We, we looked at several ways in our, some of our last teachings on how Jesus used it, but I want you to see primarily how preaching is affected. Now, you're thinking, well, why would I want to know that? Am I, I'm not a preacher. That's your job, Phillips. Uh, it is, but it's also yours. And I want, to, I want to take a look at how the sword of the Spirit will enable you to preach to things that you never thought you could preach to. And let's begin with that passage we looked at earlier in Matthew 4, where Jesus is coming out of this season, of, or it's not season, but he came through that, that, that he's been fasting for 40 days and the enemy tempted him. And after he was able to do away with the enemy through speaking what God's word says, with that sword of the spirit, we're told him, or we're told that the enemy left him for a more opportune time. And then we're, we're not told that Jesus, by the way, left his sword in the wilderness. He took that sword with him because in verse 23 of Matthew 4, it tells us this. It says, And Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Now, look over at Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, because I want you to see how this progresses. We're told there that Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So look at the progression. Uh, not only had he come through a spiritual battle that he was victorious in, but he went from, from being victorious to now taking that, that, that victory and putting it into words, but not just words that spoke over the person who needed healing, but words that taught, words that were instructive. Uh, this would be good for us who believe in the fullness of the Holy Spirit to be reminded. There should be substance to what we say. We should have something that is more than just a glory hallelujah moment. I'm all for those and we need more of them. But we also need the foundation of God's word. It says that he went about teaching in their synagogues. Teaching what? Teaching God's word. Now, what does this have to do with you? And what does it have to do with what I said earlier? Uh, you're going to be doing preaching. It has a lot to do with it because you'll never proclaim preach, declare things that you don't know. And you certainly can't teach something you don't know. So as you start to learn God's word, the victory of speaking it is one thing, but it's another thing for you to teach it. 
And I'm going to tell you who you got to teach often is the person looking back at you in the mirror. You got to say, nope, that isn't the way we're going to think. That isn't the way we're going to respond. That isn't the way that God's word says that I should be thinking right now. So I'm going to change my thinking. And then that effect can start to take place in other people's lives. Now, Matthew 10 says it this way. Look at this. Because I want you to see how this, how verse 1 of Matthew 10, how I want to look at how preaching builds faith. Look, look at this. He called the 12. Uh, and he called them and gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Look at verse 5 of Matthew 10. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, number one, what? Preach, saying saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. So look at the progression. Preach, heal, cleanse. So there are things that these men were instructed to do that you and I are instructed also to do. They are not told to do something. By the way, this wasn't for some apostolic uh, proof of their, their apostolic uh, office, M my goodness, that that substantiated their being uh, under the covering of Jesus, that they were able to do this. Well, no, what substantiated, what, what is substantiated is that the delegated authority of God's power is available to any of us who go and do what He's told us to do. Now, let, let, let's go on here. I want to um, go to uh, Mark uh, chapter 6, Mark 6 and verse 1. Mark 6, verse 1 says that he went out from there. This is a, talking about Jesus. And he came to his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And with what wisdom is this which is given to him? That such mighty works are performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But listen to Jesus' response. He says, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Verse 5, now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went out in the villages in a circuit teaching. He could do no mighty works in his own hometown, not because they didn't like him, not because they were wondering, why isn't he building the shed I paid him to build? That, that, that was part of the problem, but the problem was their unbelief. They didn't believe what he was saying. And as a result, he could do no mighty work there. You see, there, there's those arguments that we talked about last week. Uh, Mark 9, verse 23 says this, If you can believe, this is Jesus speaking, If you can believe, point at yourself and say, I can believe. I can believe. All things are possible, Jesus says, to those who believe. Now, how do we get that kind of belief? I want to believe all things are possible. I want to have the attitude that nothing, nothing is beyond God's ability. Well, let's go to Romans, Romans 10, verse 17. So simple. Just this right here will help you immensely. It says, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes, in other words, it's, it, it, the old King James says faith cometh. I like that because it's not just once, it's ongoing. It, it's something I have to have regularly. Even now, as I've been doing this teaching at level three, I can feel faith coming to me. I can just feel something God's given me afresh. It's not that I haven't heard it before, I just need it to come fresh. Why? Because when faith comes, then from the hearing of God's word, I, I begin to activate what the Word says. Now, when Jesus preached it, it happened. Wow! How would you like that? What you preach, what you say, comes to pass. Well, that happened when Jesus, 
preached. Uh, look at Luke 4, verse 16. It says that Jesus came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the, the synagogue on the Sabbath day, stood up to read. And when he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, uh, he opened it and found the place where it was written. Listen, he quotes now from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Exactly what he preaches here is what happened in the people. He preached the anointing that Isaiah prophesied would be upon him. And guess what? It was upon him. We, we know that in Acts 10, verse 36, it tells us that the word of God sent, uh, was sent there, began to minister, and in fact, we're told that it ministered. Look at Acts 10, verse 36. This is Peter's uh, preaching. He says, The word of God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is the Lord over all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all of Judea and began from Galilee, began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So when he kept, uh, let me rephrase that, when he started by, by proclaiming what happened there in Nazareth by the reading of Isaiah 61, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Guess what? The Spirit of the Lord was upon his ministry. And by the way, that same Spirit is upon you and I. Hallelujah. The Spirit that came upon Jesus, where it would be said just in a simple way by Peter, that he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the enemy. That same Spirit's working in you and me. How does it work, though? It comes into us, it empowers us, and then we begin to minister it. And it's not just ministry, ministering it or ministry through acts, it's also through our words. That's what we're learning through this. Now, Jesus preached it after he taught it and, and while he was teaching it. The preaching should involve something that instructs. I, I, I wish more of the things that I heard preached had something of value being added to us. Now, I don't like preaching that's dry and uh, of course, you never have that problem listening to me, but uh, any kind of ministry that becomes this sort of uh, like going to, you know, a boring college class. I mean, like when I was taking college courses, it was, I remember English, English 303, and that was after I had English 204 or something like, I mean, man, how many English classes do I need? It just really was rough. I'm thankful for them in some way, but some of what we need to learn from the Lord is line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We can't have always quick fixes. I believe in supernatural remedies. I believe in, in quick works of the Holy Spirit, but I also know that it takes time for you and I to assess the things of the Lord, to learn the whole counsel of God. Amen? Now, um, Go with me to Acts 8. Okay, let's go to Acts 8 and verse 4. Acts 8 and verse 4. Because I want to continue on this theme of, of the, the preaching the word, declaring the word. That's, a, that's even a better word than preaching is, is to declare. And I, I need to do a little bit of uh, explanation of what, what preaching really should do. Preaching should, should almost assault us. <laughs> it should... Uh, preaching and teaching are two different things. Teaching somebody is instructive. Uh, preaching has, uh, it, it's more of the exhortive word being spoken. It's the word that stirs you up. Now, it can stir you up and make you feel, uh, I, I remember hearing stories of, of Spurgeon, for instance, preaching, where people under such conviction would fall out of their seats. And, I mean, man, of course that happens all the time under my preaching, but... <laughs> Uh, but it should also encourage you. And I, and I actually am uh, very confident that that happens because that's something that I've watched God use when I've listened to preaching that has been effective 
that it encouraged me. It, it stretched me. It caused me to want to get out of myself and, and more into a realm of faith. Now, when Jesus preached, that happened. He, in Acts 8, um, verse 4, we're told that those who were commissioned by Jesus not only knew that it happened in his life, but now it's happening in their lives because they've been commissioned and empowered with the same spirit that empowered Jesus. Verse 4, chapter 8, says that they were scattered. They went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip came down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Well, that's a big change because they were, they were told to avoid Samaria before. Now he's going to Samaria. And it says, Multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. How did that happen? Now, I know we can keep going on with that story because there's also this work that the Holy Spirit did under Peter and John to baptize people in the Holy Spirit. But how did the whole revival start? Good preaching. He preached, says verse 4, he came and preached the word and the whole city was filled with great joy. That shows the power of words that have that kind of enunciation that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, what I'm trying to get across to you is that where you see things that aren't joyful, is there joy in your family? Is there joy on your job? Is there joy in your, your thought of how, how life is progressing? Start preaching to those situations. Start, start challenging those things to start coming under the authority of God's Word. And as you do, I, I'm going to tell you what, maybe there won't be joy in the whole city. But, you know, if you, have a jo if you have joy in your family, if there's joy in your marriage, if there's joy when you get to the office tomorrow morning, man, uh, who needs the whole city? That, that right there will, will feel like your whole world is filled with joy. Amen. And that'll start affecting the world around you. So I, I want you to see that the message is so important when it's, when it's birthed out of God's word, what we say and what we preach. Now, um, the ministry of the word being preached is important too. Let, let's go over to 2 Timothy. And uh, let's go to verse uh, uh, 2 Timothy 3, chapter 3, verse 16. Would you go there with me? We're told all scripture is given and, and is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for in uh, chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. L look back at those words at verse Two. By the way, I want to point out something. If you notice, I'm reading right through the end of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, right on into chapter 4. Chapters and verses, this is an important thing for you to know. Th those are not inspired. Those, are, those were added by, by later men, translators, and, and ones who uh, made the compendium uh, of, the, of the Bibles we now have. They added those chapters and, and verses for us to, it would be easier for us to find. They're great, but they're not inspired. So sometimes it's very important to read through the, the end of the chapter into the next chapter or through one verse to the next or try to see things in the context that they're written in. In this case, it's very important because Paul's telling Timothy, he says, listen, the scripture you have is, is profitable. It's, it's good for doctrine, for reproof. And then he says, whatever you do, you better preach it. Preach the word, not about it, not validating it, not, not tiptoeing around, trying to do these sort of inclusive things that don't offend. Listen, sometimes you just got to preach it just like God says it, and it may not be received by everybody, but there's power associated with it. Are you hearing me? And Hebrews goes on to tell us something amazing here. Hebrews 4 verse 12, it says, for the word of God is living and powerful. Now we've, we've, really delved into that. But if you couple that with what Paul just said, preach the word, what Hebrew says is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. 
when I preach, it doesn't matter how I sound. Oh, and man, I wish, uh, I wish we could talk to some people who try to sound, you know, they're intoning with the voice that sounds. Man, just talk from your heart. Let, let God's word roll off your lips. And there's power associated with that because it's not you that is that the power is contained in. It's the word of God. Now, when you preach, things happen. What you preach causes things to happen in a certain way. For instance, in early in my ministry, I uh, decided that I really believed, not just because I was raised in spirit-filled Pentecostal uh, atmospheres, I know that it was important to me personally, but then I started to see in God's Word the importance of baptism with the Holy Spirit, this incredible experience after salvation where somebody has the Holy Spirit not come in them, but come upon them and begin to speak with other tongues. Now, the reason it became important to me is because I saw Peter in the Scripture. I'd watch Peter hiding, denying, going back to his old life, fishing, to all of a sudden stepping up in front of all of those thousands of people there on the day of Pentecost and going, hey guys, whoa, 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 stop. Let me tell you about that. i uh, tell you about this. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. We're not drunk, but this is God's power at work. And with authority, how he spoke from the rest of the time that's recorded in Scripture. How did that happen? Well, he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I began to contend for that. And I began to preach it. And guess what? It not only was something that I believe, I saw people begin to have that, that wonderful power come upon their lives. I began to experience what I was preaching. I don't mean I began to experience for myself. I began to see it be experienced by other people. How about for uh, healing? Well, how in the world are we ever going to believe people can be healed if we don't preach, if we don't teach, if we don't declare that by His stripes we are healed? How, how about in the area of of soul winning, of evangelism. How in the world can we expect to win people for Christ if we don't understand that the gospel is powerful? Paul says in, first, uh, in Romans chapter 1, he says, it is the power of God unto salvation, for in it is the righteousness of God. How, how can that ever happen if that isn't enunciated, if it's just something we read about or hear about? We've got to also speak it. Does that make sense? Well, that is, that's what you're going to be preaching in, the, in these days to come. I, I pray that the confidence of God comes upon you, that you begin to have these words come back to your utterance and you begin to have them come out your mouth. Hallelujah. Promises of God are true. Thank you, Jesus. Now, uh, let, let me look at something with you. We kind of touched on this. Uh, Mark 7 is what I'm thinking about. Mark 7, verse 9. And uh, we're going to read down to verse 13. All too well, Jesus is speaking. He says, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And he said, uh, he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban. That, that means uh, it's a gift to God. In other words, I was, you were supposed to get something from me, but I'm going to give it to God. Listen, Jesus says, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. So in other words, look at the, the, the contrast here. He says, Moses said something in, his, in, in the law that Moses wrote. Now you say something. So we create our own traditions. Um, these often sound scriptural. Uh, I wrote a few down that I, 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 I actually call them pseudo-scriptures. Uh, we'll, we'll say something like, well, God works in mysterious ways. Where's that in the Bible? God works in mysterious ways. Yeah, I know His ways are above my ways, which I'm glad about because I don't see any way out of this right now. I'm glad, I'm glad he, His ways are above my ways. But he's not, He doesn't want to be mysterious. He wants to be known. He says, I, I'm, I'm coming to you now as a friend. My, well, I don't have friends that are mysterious. They may do things I don't understand, but that's not because they want me to not understand them. Um, how about this? You never know what God is going to do. Really? 
uh, he, he said, I've made my ways known to my people. My, my spirit I've put in them that I can be with them always. I will never leave them. I'll never for, forsake them. We say silly things like that. Or how about this one? This is a one that you probably know uh, isn't scriptural because it's been talked about, but that old statement, God helps those who help themselves. Well, that is ridiculous. So those are pseudo-scriptures, but we can also create our own scriptures, kind of religious-sounding uh, traditions. Uh, how about saying, um, well, I'm praying for traveling mercies. Traveling mercies. So there are some mercies that don't travel. So some, some get in my suitcase with I don't know. That, that, that sounds... <laughs> that's kind of a weird one. Um, I know people that like to pray uh, towards certain directions. Now, I, I think that that can help, but there's not power in just facing towards the east. Uh, it, also, we can get into trouble when we pray uh, with crucifixes or with our rosaries or with icons because there's not power in those things. Those don't, those don't have power in and of themselves. We need to be careful about these. Um, I, I, I don't want to go through all of these, but... Um, when we pray for people, be careful not to do this, to what I call a prayer biography. Now, Lord, you know, here's dear sister, and Lord, you know the trouble dear sister's been in. Oh, Lord, all the, the hard things she, and then we start listing all the hard things, like God didn't, didn't know that, and, you know, and to all of this silliness, and, I, you know, is this damnable stuff? No, but it's wasteful. I, we don't want to waste our words. I, if I'm going to have to hold, be held accountable for every idle word that comes out of my mouth, I want to make sure my prayers aren't idle. I want to make sure my prayers are effective and fervent and having the Word of God spoken from them. So this is so important. And also, by the way, I, just, I need to mention this. We're, we're just about done. But um, long prayers... Uh, when we pray over meals, for instance, sometimes, which just becomes so religious. Uh, when Kathy and I pray over a meal, when we're by ourselves, it can sometimes become very imp long and powerful because we start praying, thanking the Lord for the health that He's ministering to our bodies. And then we start speaking that health over our kids. We speak it over our grandkids. We start speaking it over people that we know in our church that are sick. So it's not just long prayers or short prayers. It's how you pray. And how you pray over the food. I've been asked to pray over meals because I'm a pastor and they'll want some really eloquent thing. And I learned this uh, from my mom and dad. Just bless it in the name of Jesus. So I'll get up sometimes and say, Lord, bless this food in your name, Jesus. Amen. And they're like, wow. I mean, like, we're, we got to pay you for this or what? <laughs> it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be super in, intense. It just needs to be coupled with the Word of God. Especially, and this is what's touching my heart, is um, for your children. All right? Not, there's no pain worse than a child that isn't where he should or she should be. Um, as a parent, I will tell you that you will gladly take all of the pain and more if it would remove it from your children. God knows that. God knows that. Deuteronomy 11, look there with me, Deuteronomy 11, verse 18. Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall teach them to your children, speaking to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up speaking the word of God to your children. What is it that has been said to your kids? I know there's things that, that we, we all have said that we wish we could take back. That, that doesn't do any good to replay those, those tapes. In fact, those tapes are illegal for you and I. They've been, they have been taken by God. He's bought those tapes of our mistakes, and they're illegal for us to access. But we know that there have been things in the heat of the moment that, have been, that are spoken and have been said to, to our kids, to our family, that we, in, in, um, we know that that's created, there's something negative that is in place, something even, I would say, demonic. 
Listen, that same word that brought death, now words can bring life to. You can undo the words of death by speaking words of life. So where there's been a child that's become hard-hearted, disinterested in the things of God, hard towards you, uninterested in even the family. And man, I'm telling you, there's nothing worse than a family get-together when you got people there that don't want to be there. Listen, you begin to speak life to that. You say, Lord, this is going to be a family blessed in its coming and its going. And my children shall rise and call you blessed. And when that happens, when that happens, it's not going to be by accident. It's going to be by the Word of God spoken. It's going to be by you learning that I'm not regarding anyone according to the flesh. Remember we read that? But I'm going to look at everyone as a new creation. You're a new creation, and so are they, in Jesus' name.